Many thanks to Squarespace for sponsoring this week's video. Good morning from an incredibly hauntingly beautiful, uh, I guess, woodland trip. You know, I got the best advice from a viewer, longtime viewer of the channel, a couple years ago. And they said, Mark, if you ever are checking the forecast for the next day and the predicted dew point is very close to the predicted feels like temperature, that's a good recipe for fog. And I tell you what, that has been some of the best, I guess, weather predicting, forecasting advice I've ever gotten. So sure enough, last night I was uh, checking the forecast, saw that dew point temperature was very close within like two points of the feels like temperature, or the dew point was close to the feels like temperature. And I said, you know what? I'm gonna try and get out to this, uh, this local woodland and uh, see if, uh, it all comes to fruition and there really is some fog and sure enough i couldn't believe it i got in the car this morning and uh, started to head over here and the fog was just absolutely incredible and i've been to this location i filmed a video here not well yeah maybe about four or five months ago four months ago right around fall and um, but i've been here many times and i've never seen it with uh, with fog or mist so i'm super excited that it's finally come to fruition but now the panic has set in because now i feel like it's all gonna burn off soon. So now I'm kind of like rushing around, but I'm trying to stay calm. You know, whatever is uh, meant to happen is gonna happen. So if the fog sticks around and then that's great. And if it burns off, then, you know, you can't control everything, but I'm trying to, uh, to uh, just kind of find a little bit of separation of a uh, grouping of trees in this area with a lot of that fog in the background, but uh, it's shaping up to be a absolutely fantastic morning. You know, I'm absolutely loving all of these, these trees with these really, really warm tones to the, uh, the color of the leaves. And it plays really nicely against all of the, uh, the cool tones that are in the fog behind it. And that kind of, you know, warm versus cool, I think always makes for a uh, very interesting photograph. These trees, they're, they're not everywhere in this woodland area, but they're just randomly kind of spattered here and there. So I'm gonna see if I can try and find one that's got, um, you know, a little bit of separation, a little bit of order that's uh, got a nice clean look to it. Maybe that's got some natural framing with these types of pine trees around it. Similar to this scenario, but not this exact one. But that's kind of an idea of what I'm looking for right now. So for once, I feel like I found exactly what I was looking for. I've seen behind me that uh, there's, um, I'm not sure exactly what kind of trees they are. The, the colorful warm tone trees are flanked by a lot of these pine trees. So there's uh, two on one side, one on the other, and it just kind of almost looks like they're like guarding the tree a little bit. And um, it's, uh, it's a little bit more, I should say for this area, it is kind of a simplistic scene because this is a little bit of a chaotic woodland area, but I think that this scene is probably gonna work fairly well with, uh, especially with the, uh, the cool tones and the fog. Without the fog behind it though, I don't think this would work at all. But as I was worried earlier uh, when I started this video that the fog is already starting to, uh, to thin out just a little bit, it's still very, very usable right now, but I think a little bit longer and it's gonna fade to the point to where it's not gonna really show up in any kind of photos. So there's the scene right there. I've already taken a few uh, versions of this. I'm really just playing with different apertures between F11 and F16, just to try and throw the background out of focus just a little bit. But there's a pretty good representation of what I feel like the final crop or final uh, image would look like, but I'm pretty happy with it. It's almost exactly what I was talking about earlier. Yeah, I think that's gonna come out uh, fairly good. So if you're a, a regular viewer of the channel, then you've probably heard me harp on something that I call wide or long for gosh, maybe the last three years. And mainly because I've only owned two lens. I've shot with a, a two lens setup for years now. Even back when I was shooting Sony, I always shot with two lenses. It was either wide or it was long, everything. So 
I really like the, the simplicity that that, uh, that provided or that created for me. You know, when I was on location and I reached in my bag, there was only two, dis really one choice to make. It was either just wide or long. Everything was either a wide angle shot or a telephoto shot. It streamlined my, my workflow, it streamlined my decision making, and this kind of helped um, just make my thinking when I was on location just a little bit more, um, I guess streamlined, a little bit easier. And I'm here to say that I think I might have been wrong about that. You know, I think everyone's photography evolves over time. I know mine definitely has. But uh, I think that I'm starting to encounter, and I don't want to call them issues per se, let's call them special circumstances, where I, this two lens setup just uh, isn't quite working out for me any longer. So ever since I got the Fuji GFX 100S, the, the setup that I've been using for the past, uh, I don't know, maybe four months is the uh, the 23 millimeter uh, prime lens which is about i think an 18 millimeter full frame equivalent and then i've been using that's my my wide wide lens solution and then for on the longer end of things i had the 100 to 200 which i believe is a 79 yeah 79 to 158 to be exact and on a full frame setup so between the the 23 millimeter prime and then the 100 to 200 there's a fairly big gap right there um, as you probably have already noticed but you know that was never an issue for me i even when i shot sony i had a gap and i never it, it wasn't a big deal because the majority of all of my photographs were shot either wide or long but over the last few months, I've started to, uh, to realize that there's uh, an issue, like I said, I don't want to call them issues, there's these special circumstances that would greatly benefit with uh, having a lens that could kind of fill that gap or fill that void just a little bit. So I'm going to head down this uh, path a little bit farther. The, the fog is definitely uh, starting to lift or burn off. But uh, good news is I got at least one shot. I think that fo last photo will come out okay. But uh, I'm going to see if I can find something else before the remaining atmosphere does die off. There's still a little bit of a residual fog left right now, but uh, you can probably hear it in my voice. I'm kind of panting, just kind of running around, trying to find something pretty to point my camera at and utilize this, uh, this nice atmosphere. So I'm just going to keep wandering down here and uh, see if I can find another photograph that will complement that last photo well to kind of create that, that storyboard or just kind of tell the story of this location on this particular morning. So I found this nice kind of grouping of trees here, beautiful trees, two of them. I wish it was a third one, but <laughs> two is fine. There's a little bit of fog rolling in on the top of these trees too, but what I really like about it is that it's a, there's a, a hill. It's not a mountain, it's just a hill in the background, which really eliminates a lot of the sky there. And I'm always trying to do it. Most of the time I find that the sky is usually a big distraction in woodland photography. In woodland photography, that didn't, that didn't roll off the tongue very smooth. But uh, I do like the scene, but what's often the case is when you, do, when you see a, an environment or see a location with fog, and then that fog starts to dissipate, you kind of have that like, Kind of sinking feeling you know every every scene you see you're like yeah it's a nice scene but man it was it it would have been a lot better 30 minutes ago so i'm trying to to get out of that mindset but it is something that uh, i keep uh, thinking about i've seen a couple locations where i was like oh that, that looks pretty nice but man it would look so much better with a little bit of fog but uh, i do like this setup i've already taken a few images here while that little bit of fog is kind of cresting the tops of these trees but um, i think it's okay so far but um, I kind of like the very first scene a little bit better. And here's the composition right here. Let me just turn on the exposure just a little bit. Oops, wrong way. So you can see it a little bit clearer. But uh, very basic, but I really, really like the tree on the right side. And I like the tree on the, on the left side right here. I think that kind of balances out the overall composition. So the issue I was having with my two lens setup was that I was running into scenarios where my 23 millimeter prime was just far too wide for, the, for a certain scenario. And then the other lens I had, which was the 100, 200, was just too much reach. And there was certain scenes where, and it's kept, kind of kept happening, and I should say the frequency of these issues started to, or these special circumstances started to occur more and more often, where I would say I was trying to capture a scene that only had maybe one element in it. 
and our one you know, main focal point. My wide angle lens was just far too wide to isolate that scene. And then I put on my long lens and it would be far too long to isolate that scene. Or maybe the, the scene I was trying to capture had one or two elements in it, two main focal areas. And my long lens just had too much reach to put both of those elements in there. And I was just running into scenarios where I was trying to capture a scene that had maybe one, two, or three main focal elements in it. And I didn't have the lenses that would properly, uh, that I would really, that would really be required, I should say, to capture those types of scenes. And I was really started to miss a lens that would fill that gap between 23 millimeters and 100 millimeters on this medium format camera. So the lens I ended up going with, it's an, it's an ironic one actually. And, and long story short, the, the very first lens that I ever tested with the Fuji GFX 100S back, I believe uh, almost a year ago now, last March, was the 32 to 64. That was the only lens I had for that camera at the time. And I didn't own it, I was just testing it out just like I was testing out the camera. And I found that it would just wasn't wide enough. I didn't have the 23 millimeter prime at the time. All I had was this 32 to 64. And I ended up sending it back to B&H. I didn't purchase it because it just wasn't wide enough. Ended up going with the 23 millimeter prime. Long story short, I ended up purchasing the 32 to 64 now because uh, I realized that I was, I was actually wrong about that lens. It was, uh, for one, it was an absolutely gorgeous lens. I mean, everything about it from a lens perspective was fantastic. Just the focal length seemed a little bit too long for what I needed. But now that I have the 23 millimeter prime, I realized that I really do need a 32 to 64. And this lens is absolutely fantastic. So I ended up getting that. But the good news is this is that now when I went back to, uh, to purchase that lens, there's now a $500 rebate on it. So I win, it worked out great for me. I ended up getting the lens for $500 cheaper than I would have if I decided to purchase it back then. So uh, I'll show you the lens I went with here. So here it is, the 32 to 64, the Fuji GF lens. And um, you know, it's, it's uh, I think it's the full frame equivalent of 25 to 51 millimeter. So it doesn't completely fill the gap that I have between my, my wide angle lens and my long lens, but I, I really don't need it to. I just needed something that would zoom beyond the 23 uh, millimeter prime that I had and get me somewhere closer to the, uh, the short end of my long focal length. So uh, this lens is absolutely perfect for that. It's a, it's a constant F4 lens throughout the entire aperture, which is nice aperture range which is a good thing. It's weather sealed. It's a heavy lens, but most of these GF lenses are, are fairly heavy. I believe this weighs 875 grams. Um, like I mentioned, weather sealed, but it's got an external zoom, which I wish it was an internal zoom. I think, I mean, I know why they, well, I believe I know why they didn't make it an internal zoom is because it would weigh even more than 875 grams if they did that. And they'd be making an already heavy lens much more heavier, so much heavier. But um, anyway, it's uh, not that big of a deal, but I'm more of a fan of internal zoom lenses, but I absolutely love it. Like I mentioned a moment ago, when I tested this lens out, it was super sharp, corner to corner. I loved everything about the lens. It, I just felt that it was a little bit uh, too long. I felt that it wasn't quite wide enough. But now that I have the 23 millimeter prime, if this isn't wide enough, I can go to that lens. So for the first time in my career, I can say I own the, uh, the holy trinity of lenses, the wide angle lens, mid-range zoom, and a telephoto. So I'm pretty excited about that. Not super excited about the uh, additional uh, piece of kit that I have to carry, but if it helps me get the job done, then I think it is all worth it. So the light's still really, really nice right now. It's completely clouded over. There's still a little bit of that fog just hanging around the top of the tree line. So I'm gonna head down this trail just a little bit further to see if there's anything else I can come up with just to try and take advantage of the light as, uh, as long as I can, because I do believe that these clouds are supposed to break up uh, later on this morning. So I'm feeling like maybe you have a, at least another hour to wander around. So I'm just gonna try and take advantage of that. You know, you gotta love it when that happens. I think I walked maybe a hundred yards until I found a scene that I was pretty happy with where there's this kind of little bridge going over this little brook and it's kind of kind of nice s curve to it and there's really nice trees flanking both sides at the beginning of this s curve once you get past the bridge it's a, a real kind of a obvious shot i should say but it uh it looks good it's definitely worth capturing i feel like there is a little bit of potential you know maybe you get it back home and you look at it and you're like eh, it looks a little little vanilla a little boring but uh I would rather have the option to make that decision at home versus not having the photograph at all. So here is the scene right here. Looks a little bit different since I'm just recording through my camera, but here is the overall composition. I'm just trying to determine, you know, what I want to do with this tree right here on the edge. Do I want to keep it all the way in the frame? Do I want to completely exclude it? Do I want to kind of cut it off right there. I know I definitely want to have that tree. That tree is very critical. It's got the color. It also balances the left side of the scene. So I think I'm gonna angle down 
I want the bridge coming from the bottom right hand corner of this frame as opposed to dead center because it creates a nice kind of just winding path for the viewer's eye to follow that optical journey, if you will. I think I'm going to zoom in just a touch with my trusty 32 to 64. I think something about right there I think looks pretty good. So I'm going to go ahead and take a couple versions of this right now. So I just found this scene right here that uh, it's interesting, nothing award-winning, but uh, it's a good use case for my new lens, which is pretty much all that I'm doing right now is finding scenes that would complement this focal length. But um, it's just an interesting, the, the branches there, the green moss, that's the only little real ripple in this uh, stream happens to be right there and kind of comes to a point right, right there and kind of got another stream over there. Seems like there could be uh, something interesting to do right here. And here's one of the versions of that scene I captured. I didn't film anything because I had to get uh, precariously close to that side and there's just a little bit too much going on to add filming into it. But that's one of the versions right there. It's, uh, it, like I said, nothing insane, but you know, this could be one of those scenes where you get your photos back home and you start to review them. And this ends up being one of the photographs that you love the most from now the entire day. And thank goodness you ended up capturing it. So. I think it has potential, and whenever I see something that I think has some kind of potential, I'll usually try and, and capture something as long as the conditions are still okay. Fog is completely gone, but the light is still good. So that was a perfect scenario to, uh, to capture this, and it worked out perfect with uh, this 32-64 uh, as well. Okay, I lied. I didn't I ended up coming back down here to this area. I will film it. Obviously, you're seeing it. So uh, hopefully I don't regret that decision. But I wanted to just kind of play around for just a minute. I'm going to I already captured this image with the 32 to 64 and I was zoomed all the way into 64. I actually took a couple variations, but the one that was at 64 millimeters is the one that I like the most or the full frame equivalent of, I believe, 51 millimeters. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put my, my wide angle lens on, take this same scene with, uh, without moving my tripod at all, and then also put on my long lens just to kind of compare those photographs. So here is the scene now with the 23 millimeter prime lens on, and you can, of course, obviously tell it's completely different here. Let me just... Uh, tighten this aperture down just a touch, but it's just, it's just so wide. And since it's a prime lens, there's, there's no zooming in. And since I'm right on the edge here, this is kind of the scenario that I was kind of running into. And um, in my opinion, this is really the, the issue when using a prime lens is when you get to an edge like this and there's nowhere to walk, you, you can't zoom with your feet any longer. So in this particular scenario, you can just see that the, the prime lens or the 23 millimeter lens just really doesn't, I mean, it, it looks interesting, but I definitely like the, uh, the composition better with the 32 to 64. So now I'm gonna take this lens off and put on my 100 to 200 to see how best I can frame this scene up. All right, now I have the 100 to 200 here. Let me hit movie mode and record so you can see this. And you can see how tight this composition is here. And this is zoomed all the way out at 100 millimeters, which is the full frame equivalent of, I believe, 78 millimeters. And there's, I mean, I could walk further back, but there's no further, there's no, this is the, the widest end of the, uh, of this focal length or the shortest end of this focal length here. So there's, I could zoom all the way in more, but that kind of defeats the purpose. But in this scenario, I lose that nice kind of V shape right here in the center of the frame. So that's kind of the situation I was running into. And honestly, it's, it's the standard use case of a mid-range zoom. The telephoto lens I had was too long. The wide angle lens was a prime lens and it was just too wide in some scenarios. So this is where that mid-range zoom really comes in. So I was definitely wrong about the, the 32 to 64. And like I said, I think everyone's photography evolves over time. I know mine definitely has. And I'm at this time period now where I think I really do need a, a mid-range zoom to try and give me a third option in certain scenarios when I'm on location. Now, I'm sure my photography could change again in the future and maybe I won't need the mid-range zoom or maybe I won't need a wide angle. Maybe everything will be telephoto, but I think just kind of adapting and evolving as your uh, photography evolves as well is, uh, is very important. 
that is going to be about a wrap. The clouds are starting to break up. The light is starting to get a little bit harsh and there's zero, zero, zero fog left. Um, Hey, you know what? I'm not sponsored by, by HydroPack or anything like that, but if uh, you're looking for a new water bottle for your bag, this is a great one, collapsible water bottle. My favorite aspect of it is it'll fit in pretty much any pocket in your bag. And as you drink it, the amount of space that it takes up in your bag slowly uh, diminishes as well. So I uh, actually, I don't remember how much it was. I've, I've had it for years, but I'll put a link in the description below if you're, if you're interested in a new water bottle. But um, I do hope you enjoyed this week's video. And before I do wrap things up here, I just want to say a real big thanks to the sponsor of this week's video, which is Squarespace, who I use for all of my website and e-commerce needs. Squarespace provides a dynamic and attractive online platform to create your website. You can display your photography using Squarespace's professional portfolio designs and customize the layout and look and feel of your gallery just so you can make it your own. With Squarespace's traffic overview feature, you can track trends in page visits and views to better optimize your content. And you can even grow and engage with your customers with Squarespace's email campaign tools, which will enable you to create engaging emails that match your website with your products or blog posts and logo, just so your messaging remains consistent. So if you're looking to start a new website or possibly upgrade your current website, check out squarespace.com forward slash Mark Denny for a free trial and 10% off your first purchase. So like I said, I hope you enjoyed this week's video. I know I definitely enjoyed making it. Um, it's always great to get out when the conditions are good. I wish the fog would have lasted a little bit longer, but you get what you get. You can't be too picky. I'm just uh, thankful that there was some fog and I got at least one, maybe two photos that had the, the good fog in it. So that's, uh, that's definitely nice. And most importantly, I was able to get out and test out the new lens at 32 to 64. And I'm really excited about it. I wanted to get out with it before I head to Utah to the Outsiders uh, Conference next week. So um, I'm definitely, or actually, when you see this video, yeah, it'll be next week. <laughs> so uh, this, it's definitely been uh, nice to get out with that lens. And I'm really, really excited about the, uh, the potential possibilities that it could open up for my own photography. Because like I said, I was completely wrong about it last year. And I've been wrong about mid-range zooms before. It just never really fit into my workflow. But I have to say that I, I believe there is a spot for it now. So if you have any questions about this week's video, please leave them in the comments section below. I'll do my best to get back in touch with you. If uh, you enjoyed the video, if you could like, subscribe, share it with your friends if you really enjoyed it. And uh, as always... I really do appreciate you watching this week's video, and I will see you all next Wednesday. Bye.